Hello there, this is Professor Khan joining you again. We're going to walk through the setting slideshow presentation and talk a little bit about setting terms and concepts. Your paper three is asking you to identify aspects of setting in the story that you've chosen and furthermore to um, write about how some of those settings link up to the story's central idea. So this slideshow is uh, designed to introduce you to basic concepts and terms associated with setting with an emphasis on uh, the four aspects of setting. Setting is you know, one of the elements of fiction. Uh, paper three is very similar to paper two in that regard. Instead of writing about character and conflict and linking those elements of fiction to a story central idea, uh, here you're uh, linking setting to central idea. And of course, paper three will also have you uh, write about narrator and point of view and there is a separate uh, slideshow and presentation for narrator point of view. So I recommend that you uh, watch that and study that slideshow as well. I would also advise uh, before we move on that you, you know, spend a little bit of time going over the central idea presentation and slideshow again uh, in, in uh, your preparation and drafting for, for paper three. Uh, take a look at the sample central idea statements that I have listed out in module three. And, um, you know, go back into that cause and effect slideshow as well, because you will be asked to uh, make cause and effect arguments, like I say, linking setting and later on narrator point of view to the story's central idea. But for now, let's focus our attention on setting. Setting, uh, I don't think is a terribly difficult, you know, concept to grasp. I think most people have a basic understanding of what we mean by setting in a story. Setting refers to the surroundings of a story, the physical, temporal, cultural, and emotional spaces within which a story occurs. And you can probably tell by that short list, physical, temporal, cultural, and emotional, that there are different aspects of setting. And uh, in paper three, I'm asking you to identify examples of all four of those. You certainly don't need to identify all examples uh, in a story, but certainly uh, try, to, try to give us at least one or two solid examples of each those four aspects now. We'll call the first one place and location, the second one time and duration, the third one milieu, and the final one mood and atmosphere. So let's start with the first one, place and location. The place location setting refers to the physical spaces where a story is set, the uh, physical geographical spaces where it's set. And I think that, you know, when most people hear the, the term setting when it when it comes to short stories or you know films and, and novels and TV shows and so forth, uh, I think this is probably the, the aspect of setting that most people, you know, understand the most. Uh, it's it's one of the more obvious aspects of setting by far. So let's look at some examples of place and location setting in, in some of the stories that we've read so far. In Cathedral, Raymond Carver story, you know, the, the entire story is basically set within the narrator's home. Uh, we kind of move around in the home. We, we are in the kitchen at one point. Uh, in a brief scene where uh, the, the wife and, and Bub are, are talking, uh, the preparing dinner, and the scene occurs sort of in the middle 
several of the two chunks of early backstory that we get at the the front end of cathedral uh you know eventually we're in a, a dining room eating dinner and then the rest of the story takes place uh it's sort of in the living room or, or the tv room as uh the characters kind of watch tv uh, the wife um she goes upstairs at one point she's downstairs she falls asleep downstairs uh but uh, bub and, and robert uh, you know sort of take over the story and, and engage in dialogue there in the living room um we you know don't know exactly what city the story is taking place in you know i think we can make an educated guess and say it's probably occurring somewhere in new york i don't think it's happening like downtown or anything it seems to be maybe more of a suburban setting yeah you know, this is just an educated guess you know i also know that carver uh, a, a number of his stories actually his more famous stories are are uh, set in sort of suburban America. Carver was very interested about the suburban lifestyle. Uh, we certainly do know that the story is set on the East Coast, and we, we know that from the conversation between uh, the characters regarding Robert's train ride. So, you know, rooms of a house, specific rooms of a house, all the way to cities and regions, parts of the country. These are all potential aspects of place and location setting. The story of an hour is another good example of a setting that's you know really confined to a single room in a house. Uh, the story is set in Louise and, and uh, Brentley's house. Uh, the story begins downstairs, you know, where Louise hears the news of her husband's death, but she quickly runs upstairs and spends the majority of the story, even though it's quite a short story, in her bedroom. Um, she looks out the window at one point. She, she sits in a big, comfortable chair and sort of looks out the window. And it's this beautiful sort of spring day outside. So that's an element of setting, too. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit more when we get to the time setting. Uh, but the bedroom is the primary setting of the story of an hour. And of course, she does you know, go back downstairs at the end of the story. And of course, we know how that, that story ultimately resolves. In the lesson, uh, you know, the characters, uh, Sylvia, Sugar, Miss Moore, the kids, they all begin in their neighborhood where they live. Uh, this is neighborhood is later referred to as a as a slum, uh, which is an idea that Sylvia really sort of takes offense at. It's a lower class, you know, part of part of the city. This is set in New York City. We don't know specifically the neighborhood that they're in in New York City, but we do know that it's a lower class sort of neighborhood. We do know characters in the story um, are uh, people of color. Uh, so, you know, we can make maybe some educated guesses on what part of the city it, it might be. Uh, but, you know, they take a field trip and they go uh, uptown. They visit the FAO Schwartz toy store, which is a very old and very famous uh, toy store. Uh, if you're interested, you might just Google it and, and uh, read a little bit about it. There's some YouTube videos of people kind of taking little walking tours through the toy store. And this store is sort of known for its high-end, uh, expensive, uh, really beautiful toys and gifts. But it's definitely a high-end, upper-class, upper socioeconomic uh, sort of place to, to, to shop. And of course, that's the whole point of Miss Moore taking the kids there. She wants to show them how, how the so-called other half live, the people with money, and kind of shock them out of their, their understanding of the world. Uh, so we have the story taking place in two very different parts of the same city, New York City. And, uh, you know, we do go into the store, FAO Schwartz. Uh, we're in a cab uh, for a, a little bit of the story as they, they're driving to, uh, to the store. Uh, and then at the end, um, you know, Sylvia and, and Sugar are together and Sylvia ends up running off to be by herself away from Sugar. And, and we might consider that a brief look at another another aspect of place and location setting. So a number of places scattered around the city uh, here in the lesson. A and P, we're set in a town. Um, how can we describe this? It's kind of like a vacation town. It's a town that 
you know, has kind of a small population uh, until summertime rolls around. And then people uh, with uh, a higher level of income, people of a higher uh, socioeconomic class come into town and they're either renting vacation homes or maybe they own a vacation home uh, in or near this town and they take their summer vacations there. So I'm thinking of, you know, a place like Cape Cod, you know, someplace in Massachusetts, maybe near the coast uh, where uh, people can vacation and be near the water uh, over the summertime. Sammy, the main character, of course, is a, a local local kid and um, he works in the A&P store. A&P stands for the Atlantic and Pacific store. And the A&P, I think there might even be a few A&Ps that still exist scattered around the country. But the A&P used to be a, a fairly famous uh, chain of dry goods stores, kind of in the early and middle part of the, the 20th century. Uh, so the story is set in this town. We don't know the name of the town. Um, and it's, of course, really all the action takes place within the store itself. So those are the two really place and location settings that are active in A&P. In O'Connor's story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, the family uh, lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and of course they leave home in order to take a road trip. Um, and you know they're in the, their car for several hours, a good part of the day. So they're traveling through Georgia. There's a place location setting for you, they pass mountain uh, which has uh, been in the news here recently actually there's a big confederate monument on stone mountain uh, but stone mountain is a very uh, sort of iconic southern location uh, they stop at red sammy's barbecue joint and gas station uh, there are still places like this in the united states uh, but this this trip is sort of happening not on uh, uh, you know a huge interstate highway where you might you know run across a, a massive truck stop gas station restaurant gift shop kind of kind of facility this one's a lot more uh, lower key <laughs> uh, off a uh, state highway i imagine uh, but yeah the family stops there of course for for lunch and the grandmother and Red Sammy get into a conversation about, you know, the good old days and, you know, how everything's going to hell these days. Uh, and we have uh, sort of a roadside attraction. There's a monkey chained to a, a tree or something there. Uh, so we have sort of this uh, interesting slice of Americana, uh, this little roadside attraction, barbecue joint, filling station, all kind of rolled into one sort of owned and operated by a, a fellow with certainly some some character to him, some local color about him. Uh, and then, of course, the story uh, resolves, you know, after the, the car has turned off the, the main road and gone down a kind of a gravel rock road uh, with the intention of trying to find a plantation house, which doesn't actually exist. And uh, the, the cat leaps out of the bag and onto... Bailey's shoulder, which causes a wreck. Uh, so we were in, sort of out in the middle of the sticks, so to speak, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, during the final scene, extended long scene of A Good Man is Hard to Find. Uh, go back into that story, by the way, and, and read how the narrator uh, describes the, the setting, especially the trees and the sky. And it's all very interesting the way the narrator focuses on that sort of countryside setting especially there in the second half of the story. In the lottery, uh, the story is set in a, an unnamed village, uh, specifically in the town square as the, the villagers are gathering together for the lottery ceremony. Um, you know, this story is not set in our world, so to speak. Um, it's, it's set in kind of an alternate history or an alternate universe. Uh, it's, it's not a science fiction story or anything, but it does have a, a bit of a fantastical nature to it, considering the, the nature uh, and uh, purpose of the lottery itself. Um, but I think the town is, is 
uh, you know, sort of representative of and, and reflects sort of a small town, American small town um, place setting. Uh, we do hear about a coal mine nearby, I believe, and there's tractors. And, and so we kind of get the sense that, you know, this is a working class kind of town, uh, agrarian uh, farmers uh, who work there, you know, much like we might might see a, a small town with, a, with its own little town square, you know, today. So those are all major examples of place and location setting in, in the stories that we've we've read so far some of the stories we've read so far. Uh, the next aspect of setting is time and duration. Time and duration setting refers to the temporal spaces. Temporal refers to time. The temporal spaces, when a story is set, so place and time are the two most dominant and I think easily identifiable aspects of setting. Look at some examples again. In cathedral, um, we have sort of years of, of backstory. You know, we've got quite a bit of backstory at the beginning of cathedral where uh, Bub, the narrator, is telling us about the, the, the wife's past, you know, her previous marriage and her friendship with Robert and her, her uh, writing poetry and these sorts of things her suicide attempt. So we don't know how, how far back that goes necessarily, but we do have uh, quite a bit of time captured in that backstory. Uh, but in terms of the action of the story itself, you know, the, the dinner and the after dinner conversation with Robert, um, you know, that we assume it seems to take probably a few hours of time. So that's duration, you know, the, the amount of time uh, in which a story takes place we have all different types of time and duration settings that are that are possible a good rule of thumb in terms of time setting is unless the the narrator states otherwise or, or provides you know obvious clues in the story we can generally assume that a story takes place around the same time that it was written and or published. So if you look at the end of any story in our textbook, uh, there's a year and that year indicates the year that the story was uh, first published. So you can use that year as, as sort of a, a guide to when the story was written. Uh, so this story, Cathedral, um, you know, is set around the same time that it was that it was probably written seems like a fairly, fairly contemporary story, uh, 70s, you know, thereabouts. In the story of an hour, uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, Louise, when she's upstairs, she looks out the window onto a beautiful spring day with the birds singing and, uh, you know, uh, blue sky and so on and so forth. This is a lovely day. So we can, you know, look at seasons the four C's and uh, consider those to be time settings. Uh, the hour of time it takes for this story to unfold. I mean, this story is literally called the story of an hour. So really from the time that Louise hears about the death of her husband to the time when she herself dies at the very end takes an hour or even hour. So the duration of this story is an hour of time and that's you know that's meaningful um considering how far louise has gotten in terms of her epiphany uh, an hour is not a lot lot of time <laughs> for that sort of thing so that seems to suggest that uh, these ideas maybe have been brewing a lot longer than than maybe even louise um, louise is aware of and you know of course spring springtime has certain connotations to it new life and so on. Look at these sort of um, uh, aspects of setting as well. In the lesson, uh, this is set in the summertime. Of course, Sylvia is complaining about how, you know, hey, it's summertime. Why is Miss Moore making us be in school? We, we you know, it's time to go have fun and go swim and, and so on. Uh, so here we have another season alluded to. Uh, we take, uh, you know, the better part of a day to go uh, 
um, on this field trip. And uh, again, this story is set, uh, was published in the in the 70s. So that's, you know, like I said, the rule of thumb, we can probably assume that that's when the story is, is also taking place. And, you know, that's really all we, we need to know in terms of a formalist approach. We could dive deeper into this and investigate and, and study, you know, what was going on in the 70s in New York City in terms of the econ economic climate, and, uh, in terms of uh, civil rights and, you know, all of these sorts of things. And that would be interesting, but, you know, that would require research. Formalism doesn't require that we necessarily need to go that deep, at least for our purposes now. Uh, in A and P, we have another summertime story. It's pretty appropriate since we're in a summer class. Um, as I said earlier, you know the town is, is sort of being filled up with people who are not from the town. They're coming into town in order to take their summer vacations. Uh, and in terms of duration, you know, um, the girls come in. They kind of do a quick tour of the store in order to find what they're looking for. And then we have the confrontation at the end. So, you know, I can't imagine this takes longer than 15, 20 minutes at, at most. So the duration of the story is not that long. Uh, we can kind of tell from uh, Sammy, the narrator, that he's sort of looking back at this event. He's, he sort of adds a little side commentary like, you know, this is the part where the story gets really sad or something like that. So, you know, he's not in the moment uh, experiencing the story as he's narrating it. He's looking back on it from a, a future point in time. And that, that might be an interesting aspect of setting as well uh, in conjunction with the narrator's point of view and stance. Good man is hard to find. Uh, we have, you know, a duration, several hours traveling during the day. Uh, the story is set, again, about contemporaneous to when it was written, when it was published. So we're looking at the 1950s. And finally, the lottery. Here we have a very specific date, June 27th, another summer story. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if a good man is hard to find is set in the summertime as well. After all, the kids are going on the road trip, so it's probably summer vacation. Um, and, of course, we also hear from, uh, in the lottery, from old man Warner, right? He's the oldest uh, villager. He's been able to survive the lottery over his many years. And uh, he talks about the lottery a little bit in terms of the, it being a yearly yearly tradition. And in terms of duration, uh, you know, the, the, the story does say that other neighboring towns, larger towns, sometimes take days to go through the lottery process. That's not true for this town. It's quite a bit smaller. So it seems the, the duration of the events in the story take place probably over just a couple hours or so. The third aspect of setting is milieu. Milieu is a <clears throat> French word that refers to the physical and social settings. We're going to um, sort of uh, uh, leave out the physical part <laughs> of, of the milieu definition since we've already covered physical setting and instead focus on the social setting. And we'll expand that out a little bit to include cultural, historical, political, and even ideological spaces uh, that sort of wind their way or, or permutate a story. Um, milieu, depending on the story, milieu can be a lot uh, more subtle. Um, it may be a little harder to detect. <clears throat> and in some cases, you know, we do have to pick up on certain clues um, that suggest milieu. So, uh, you know, if you read, for instance, the, the sample paper three, I write about uh, James Joyce story, Araby, and that's why I'm not including Araby in, in this slideshow, because there is a, a sample paper over it. Um, you know, one of the aspects of milieu is all about the conflict between um, Ireland and, and England, right? And uh, that, that's a, that's a, a deep cultural struggle, that's a religious conflict, uh, it's a political conflict, 
and certainly at the time the story was written, um, it was uh, very much uh, a point of contention. So there are a few references to that in the story, and it does permutate the story. It does sort of throw a, a certain shadow, if you will, over the story. But if you know nothing about the troubles in Ireland um, and the conflict, then you know those sort of clues are gonna gonna kind of go over your head. So sometimes milieu, we need to really pay attention and pick up on these things as best we can. Certainly, let me know if you're having trouble with milieu in the story you've chosen for for paper three. But I'll give you some examples. Uh, in cathedral, we've got this <clears throat> story about you know married life. Um, and, you know, that is sort of a, a culture unto itself. Um, Bub and his wife, you know, seem to be middle class-ish white couple. Uh, they're in an unhappy marriage. Uh, and this is linked, I think, somewhat to this notion of suburban malaise. This, this idea that, you know, if you, if you are married and you own a house in the suburbs, you know, you've you've achieved the American dream. You own your little kingdom, your little plot of land, uh, and you're all set. But the idea, of course, is that that alone doesn't bring you happiness. And both Bub and his wife are certainly <clears throat> quite unhappy in their own uh, unique ways. Uh, we also might consider um, Robert <clears throat> and his relation relationship to Bub as well as to the outside world, the world around him. Um, you know, it is it is true that uh, differently abled folks will sometimes speak about a culture that is unique to them. Uh, so we might even delve a little bit into this notion of, of a blind culture uh, versus a sighted culture. Um, you know, this I think especially is is shown when Bub is, you know, trying to describe what a cathedral looks like to Robert, and Robert has never been able to see. So these these visual descriptions that Bub is giving him are really just pretty meaningless. And where they they uh, evolved, and, and Robert suggests the more tactile um, activity of of trying to draw a cathedral uh, to help paint that image. Uh, if you will, in, in his mind. In the story of an hour, <clears throat> we have the um, sort of idea of social responsibility that kind of hangs over the story and patriarchy, this notion that um, the society is, is telling Louise, uh, you know, your job is to be married. <laughs> your job is to be in love and be married. You know, that's how we have kids. That's how we propagate the species. That's how the social order is maintained. Uh, these things are not brought up directly and overtly in the story, um, but certainly uh, Kate Chopin's work and this story being a, a good example of it, you know, is considered a definitely a feminist writer. You know, here we've got a, a female character who ultimately rebels against um, what society expects of her uh, in terms of being in love with another person and being married to another person. In the lesson, the lesson is very much about milieu. I think this may be the story where milieu is at its most obvious. You know, Miss Moore's whole point is to expose milieu to the kids. Uh, she wants to take the kids out of their neighborhood and throw them, you know, headfirst, face to face with um, this other part of the city. And they all live in the same city, but it might as well be on another planet as far as the kids are concerned. Uh, you know, this place where white people walk around in the summer wearing fur coats and you've got these, you know, ridiculously expensive toys that are that are on offer at, at the FAO Schwartz store. Uh, and of course, the whole point is to teach a lesson, hence the title, the lesson. And the lesson is all about the socioeconomic differences, as well as the racial inequality um, that exists. And Miss Moore's purpose, I think, is to 
um, inspire the kids and kind of jolt them into awareness. And we certainly see this happening with with Sugar and some of the other kids, and, and ultimately we see that with Sylvia. In A and P, we've got this sort of uh, I like to call it the townie versus the tourist uh, sort of social interaction, social conflict, even. You know, uh, Sammy doesn't hold back in terms of his his opinions. Uh, at least he doesn't hold back internally. He's a first person narrator, so he's thinking these things. But we have access to those thoughts, and he he doesn't think much of the the sort of slack jawed townies that he <laughs> that, that come into the store all the time. Um, but he certainly has some opinions about the tourists as well, and specifically about the three girls who come in. And <clears throat> and again, it it you know it may not be apparent on just a, a first read, but those three girls are <clears throat> are coming in for vacation. You know, they're wearing swimsuits. Um, they come from a, a higher socioeconomic level than Sammy does. That's one of my favorite parts of the story. Uh, if you read the, uh, the A paper sample, whether you uh, attempt to write the A paper or not, read that sample. It's over, it's over A and P. Um, you know, the girls are, are going in to buy this fancy herring snack. You know, it's kind of a, a pricey uh, can of, of snack food for, for some party or something. And Sammy thinks about, well, what kind of party could they possibly throw? And he, he imagines, you know, the men at this party wearing these ice cream parlor suits so there was a time when you know you'd go down to the ice cream parlor and you'd uh, there'd be a, uh, a, a guy in a in a hat and a white suit with a little white bow tie and his job was to you know fix your ice cream for you uh, and we don't really have that anymore but sammy who is never really seen a fancy party probably he's not seen a person wear a tuxedo or a suit or something like that you know he imagines the guys at this fancy party are wearing these ridiculous ice cream suits because they have bow ties on them and then he thinks about the glasses that these folks probably drink out of and he compares them to the glasses that he and his family use at home which are uh, tall glasses with cartoons <laughs> stenciled upon them. So Sammy seems to come from a lower economic class <clears throat> than the girls do. And I think that's part of the <clears throat> the tension and the conflict in the story as well. Uh, Lengel, the manager, you know, not only is he the manager of the store, which means he sort of represents the, the values of all American capitalism. You know, the A&P is this sort of all American store. Uh, he's also a Sunday school teacher, I believe. So he also kind of represents the sort of a Christian uh, family values, you know, sort of thing. Um, he represents sort of the wholesome values, like the Norman Rockwell's American wholesome values. And these girls from out of town who walk in showing bare skin, you know, that's just not not to be done. That that goes against those wholesome values. All of that stuff is milieu in A and P. Good man is hard to find. Oh boy, so many possibilities here for milieu. Um, you know, the grandmother sort of represents these Southern values, uh, these older Southern values versus a more modern era. <clears throat> this is certainly a theme that O'Connor was, was very interested in, in some of her best stories. Um, the grandmother, you know, believes that, you know, young people should be respectful of their elders and respectful of their home state and uh, all of these sorts of things. And yet she will toss out a racial slur at the drop of a hat um, and is, you know, a hypocrite. And that's really the point of, of her character. Uh, her son, Bailey, and the wife, um, you know, are these, uh, you know, the, the Bailey, of course, is the patriarch of the family. He's the, he's the guy in charge. He's the father, head of the household. He's the one uh, driving. So we, we do have this sort of all American road trip milieu. Um, you know, this, this archetypal American experience of, you know, the 
the family getting in the car and driving for a vacation. And I'm sure a number of us have had that experience. And a number of us probably know that there's all sorts of tensions that are <laughs> in the car uh, and so on. And we certainly see that here. Bailey is uh, embarrassed and angered by his mother throughout the entire story. Uh, and then, of course, the kids are just totally disrespectful of the grandmother and of uh, the state of Georgia. It's a hillbilly dumping ground, John Wesley says. Um, and so this this idea of, you know, values, sort of old time values uh, clashing with a more modern sensibility. This is part of the milieu in the story. And, and I haven't even mentioned the religious stuff that's going on. <clears throat> O'Connor was a Catholic uh, born in, in Georgia, uh, surrounded by Southern Baptists. And obviously you have a very religious uh, theme that makes itself apparent in, in the story. <clears throat> the misfit and the grandmother are basically, and this is in O'Connor's words actually, sort of sparring with each other over the, the, the nature and divinity of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and the misfit ultimately is able to sort of show the grandmother um, the, uh, the, the truth, so to speak, is able to sort of expose the grandmother as the, that she is. Uh, but of course, in doing that, she, the misfit is also murdering the grandmother. So it's obviously a very violent story, uh, but it's also a very spiritual story in its own sort of dark and, and humorous and unique way. Uh, and then finally, in the lottery, we've got you know this milieu of small town life. If you're if you you know are from a small town, you know people know each other. Small towns tend to be safer, more close knit. Uh, we've got that thing going on. Everybody seems to know each other in the small town. Um, and then we've got the tradition of the lottery itself. The lottery is a is a holiday, a, a tradition. It's a ritual, as it turns out. Um, and old man Warner, you know, says at one point, uh, he sort of recalls an old saying or an old poem or maybe a bit of a song about the lottery about the lottery in June, corn be heavy soon. So that is a clue that the lottery, at least at one point, was some sort of harvest ritual. If you do the lottery and a townsperson is sacrificed, then that will ensure that the crops are good that season. Finally, we get to perhaps the most abstract uh, of the aspects of setting mood and atmosphere. Mood and atmosphere setting refers to, I just call them the vibes, the emotional vibes. Uh, it's kind of a hippie term, but I, I think you know what I mean. Just the, the, the vibrations or the resonance, emotional resonances and connotations that the various settings give off. Um, you know, milieu, both milieu and mood and atmosphere are highly dependent upon place setting and time setting. So, you know, all of these aspects of settings interact with each other, but in particular mood and atmosphere is really based on the other aspects of setting. You know, a certain place setting will give off a certain type of emotional response. Now it's important to understand that when we use mood and atmosphere in terms of setting, we're not necessarily talking about the emotional states of characters. We're not talking about the tone of voice of a narrator either. We'll talk about tone in the narrator point of view slideshow. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> there's a really great uh, Edgar Allan Poe story. In fact, it's in our book. It's called The Cask of Amontillado. And during the bulk of the story, the two main characters are winding their way down into the catacombs underneath this ancient house. And it's dark, there are cobwebs everywhere, it's cold, there are uh, skeletons and skulls and you know all sorts of creepy things lying around. 
yet, and so this, that setting, you know, I think most people would agree that setting is scary, spooky, creepy, unpleasant. Uh, those are all moods and atmospheres that that setting gives off. Yet the characters are having a great time. They're, they're drunk. They're, you know, t the main character is telling jokes. Uh, the other character is just having a final time and just seems to be oblivious to the to the creepiness of the setting. And of course, that's to that character's detriment. I highly recommend that post story. That's a good example of how mood and atmosphere can be different from the emotional states of characters. Some examples here in Cathedral, you know, we're, we were the story is set in this, uh, you know, suburban all-american um, home uh, it's you know it's not described in any detail but it just seems kind of bland kind of boring uh, you know I think one of the pivotal scenes is when they're eating dinner and god what are they eating they're eating scalloped potatoes and I don't know some sort of beef dish uh, beef what is it beef wellington or a meatloaf or something like that and milk um you know it's just this really <laughs> bland boring uh midwestern almost kind of dinner um and i think that that dinner really does itself give off mood and atmosphere um you know what's going on with the characters is is turns out to be quite interesting uh, but and, and and not bland and boring, but the setting itself really does kind of give off that domestic bland and, and kind of boring to, uh, mood and atmosphere. In the story of an hour, you know, think about a bedroom. What sort of mood does a bedroom tend to give off? Uh, you know, why does Louise run up there to begin with? Well, she wants to be alone. You know, nobody's going to barge into the bedroom. It's her her room. A bedroom is a safe space. Uh, it's a place where people can go to be alone, get away from others, get away from the rest of the world. It's where they sleep, so it's a secure place. Um, it's a place where you can, you know, relax and, and meditate and think. And that's what Louise is doing. So the tone, the mood and atmosphere of, of the setting, I think, is sort of a safe mood, a safe and, and nurturing atmosphere. Uh, but we look out the window onto that spring day, and it's a very vibrant, very sort of life-affirming atmosphere that that scene gives off. And that's very interesting, considering what Louise is dealing with, both in terms of the death of her husband and this newfound life that she's beginning to realize that she, she now has in front of her. Uh, in the lesson, you know, we don't get a lot of description of the neighborhood that the kids live in um, for me both both that setting that place setting as well as later when they're uptown um, they give off this very lively sort of setting I mean you know if you've ever been to a big city in particular New York City you know there's just people everywhere there's activity going on all the time so there's all of this motion all of this human activity around and the neighborhood that the kids come from seem, seems to be a very, you know, lively place. Uh, the kids are running around outside playing and goofing off and getting into trouble. Uh, you know, there's these references to how they have conflicts with other, you know, groups of kids. Um, there just, you know, seems to be quite a bit of activity. And the kids calm down quite a bit once they're uptown in front of the toy store. But there's people walking by, you know. So there's just this kind of lively, vibrant atmosphere that I think the settings give off. But at the same time, there's a discordant feel to it. Uh, the one setting being this, you know, more familiar, um, yet lower class, more poor part of town with a certain socioeconomic and racial makeup. And then the kids are thrust into this totally different part of town where they feel somewhat alien. In A&P, um, you know, the story was written, of course, at a certain time, and it reflects that time. But I think Updike was really also 
uh, trying to capture sort of an old timey feel to the A&P. You know, th things were changing during that time period when it was written, but the A&P really is kind of a throwback to an earlier era in America. Uh, it's kind of, and of course, it's kind of stuffy <laughs> in there, right? It's a little, it's a little uptight in there. And this, of course, is all th thanks to Lengel and the milieu that he sort of imposes upon the A&P store. Good men is hard to find. Um, I think we've got a number of moods happening. Uh, there's a bit of tension in the car just between, you know, the characters. Uh, you know, within a car itself is, is, you know, pretty neutral mood itself. But thanks to all of the tension in the car, we just, I think, get a tense atmosphere in the car. The car is a place setting, I would say. Uh, and because we have this milieu sort of theme of the modern versus the old fashioned or the, the traditional values, I think we have this conflict in terms of mood and atmosphere between this sort of old fashioned sort of mood. We see that quite a bit in the uh, barbecue joint, Red Sammy place. Uh, and, you know, maybe the car itself being this more modern uh, piece of technology that the family is using to, to take their road trip in. And then, of course, at the end, um, you know, the description of the, the silver trees and, and the hill, and the sky, you know, on the, on the one hand, these are all sort of lovely natural descriptions or descriptions of the natural world. But I don't know, maybe I've just read the story too many times, but I think the way the narrator describes that stuff, especially in the second half of the story, just is really creepy. So I get a very sort of creeped out atmosphere <laughs> coming off of those descriptions. In the lottery, uh, you know, everyone's gathering together in this small town square and everybody seems to be chipper and in a good mood. And that helps contribute to, I think, sort of the all American uh, festive communal atmosphere um, that uh, that permutates the lottery. Uh, of course, once we've read the story and we realize what the lottery represents, you know, that scene uh, for instance, at the very beginning where the boys are gathering rocks seems to be a pretty harmless activity that takes on a whole new meaning. So I think the mood and the atmosphere of this story might change depending upon how many times you've read the story. I would say just as a final note about mood, that mood and atmosphere is considerably more subjective than the other aspects of setting. And I think it can really depend quite a bit upon the reader and the reader's experiences and the reader's, you know, history and, and what the reader, uh, what the reader's own experiences with similar settings or, or connotations that the reader draws from the various other settings of the story. So just try your best with mood and atmosphere in paper three. If you need help with that or anything else in paper three, please let me know.